uh, one of the newer members of the Cornell Soft Materials community, Professor Xiaoyi Zheng. Uh, so this is uh, also a bit of a homecoming for Xiaoyi. He received his uh, PhD uh, in chemical engineering from, from Cornell um, and uh, had his first faculty appointment at Kansas State University, uh, followed that with, with uh, several years at University of Washington and uh, just joined us back here at, at uh, Cornell um, a little over a year ago. Um, he's a pioneer in the development of uh, zwitterionic materials, uh, zwitterionic hydrogels, specifically for a variety of, of biomedical applications. Um, he's published over 300 papers that have been cited over 30,000 times, uh, more than 50 patents. Uh, he has numerous awards, including being a fellow of, of uh, AACHE and uh, AMBE, um, chair of many conferences, particularly on zwitterionic materials. Um, and uh, has, has brought his expertise in this new area to us uh, here at Cornell. So with that, I will uh, turn the podium over to Xiaoyi. Larry, thank you so much for your uh, introduction and also for your uh, invitation uh, to give this uh, presentation. So today I'm going to talk about the highly uh, biocompatible uh, zwitterionic hydrogel and elastomer. And David Mooney you know, is a uh, pioneer uh, in this field of the biomedical application of hydrogel. So this morning, uh, he gave us several uh, amazing, um, you know, example of the uh, application of the hydrogel from a cell to uh, adhesive. So for my talk, I will mainly uh, focusing on uh, how do you control biocompatibility and also mechanical property together, because these two properties usually uh, they don't come together. Actually, they get against each other. So for example, if you want a higher biocompatibility, you need material hydrophilic, and if you want, um, you know, to have like a strong mechanical property, you need to be hydrophobic. So layer four, you know, how do we achieve um, the our target, you know, without complement, uh, without a compromise, uh, and both a uh, high mechanical property and also uh, uh, biocompatibility. So I would like to give by uh, give a quick uh, introduction on the uh, what's the biofouling problem and material immunogenicity, and also uh, you know give a quick introduction of the zwitterionic material. That's the work I have been doing uh, last twenty years in the University of Washington. And then I moved to uh, Cornell, as uh, Larry, I just mentioned, you know, one year ago. So now I got a Zwitterani 2.0. So I will show you uh, what's new here. Okay, so here I'm giving a bunch of uh, uh, different uh, applications from a uh, medical device, from the drugs to a uh, consumer product to uh, marina fouling. So all these applications uh, looks very different, but they share one common is the, uh, we need to do uh, some sort of the uh, bio fouling control, otherwise, with the biofouling, uh, it will compromise the uh, performance of all these device. So today, if you ask the people, you know, how do you do a uh, biofouling control? So people will all point to uh, polyethylene glycol. So PEG is the gold standard, has been used since 70. And, you know, actually uh, has been a uh, well known and people like George Weiser had published a paper a long time ago showing the, uh, the polyethylene glycol are subject to oxidation for oxygen carbon bond in a biological uh, relevant uh, medium. And so there's another issue actually that's less known is that the, uh, a lot of people thinking about a polyethylene glycol is hydrophilic and which is partially true because with the oxygen, you know, yes, it's hydrophilic, but at the same time, the polyethylene glycol has two carbon and also a methoxy uh, terminating group so actually, it's the uh, also it has some hydrophobicity coming from uh, you know the other part of backbone and also a terminal group. So therefore, the PEG is really uh, amphiphilic. So the strong evidence of this is that the polyethylene guy can can dissolve in um, water and also it can dissolve in organic solvent. So if anything can go to organic solvent, meaning uh, it has hydrophobicity. And our body system is an aqueous system and don't like anything uh, hydrophobic like protein. You know, all the hydrophobic have been squeezed inside and only hydrophobic, uh, you know, living, um, uh, you know, just like uh, live outside. So people have been proposing the, uh, you know, how do we, so we are changing a methoxy group to an OH group to make a PEG more hydrophobic. But now it comes to another issue that's called a complement activation. So OH can, uh, you know, causing another uh, complement. So biological system is very complicated. And a lot of time when people talk about a non-fouling from conventionally, people usually are defined using a single protein or 10% serum, or maybe uh, even uh, you know, with the cell adhesion and to uh, judge whether the system is non-fouling or not. But actually the bar is not high enough. So really the high bar is you inject the uh, material into the blood, you know, it don't generate antibody. And also you are implant 
the material into the uh, tissue, sub Q in, in implantation, and it doesn't induce the uh, capsule formation. So those are really a high bar. So that's what the uh, you know the uh, you know the uh, uh, you know the that's why I always said the uh, uh, by a complex biological uh, medium matters. So if you look at the uh, there's two uh, science article last December and also January showing the Pfizer vaccine you know, raise the uh, allergy concern and likely are uh, due to uh, polyethylene glycol because the PEG is not that hydrophilic, that hydrophobic, you know, under this condition, they can be uh, generating, uh, you know, anti-PEG antibody. So over the last, uh, you know, 20 years or so, we have been uh, working on uh, several uh, zoetani material. So in the early day, we were working on uh, sulfur betaine. So if you look at the old literature, 30 or 40 years ago, people using sulfur betaine, you know, in the petroleum exploration, there's a surfactant that's just pumping a sulfur betaine into our ground and try to get the oil out. So very cheap. And now, real because that yeah, we show that sulfur betaine is the uh, non-fouling property. Now this has been widely uh, used in industrial process, like membrane fouling control, marine coating, you know, all kind of industrial application. But for our research group, we have been uh, focusing a lot on carboxybetaine. It's because we want to, uh, you know, push the extreme of biocompatibility. So if you look at the carboxybetaine, really the active ingredient is the glycine betaine. So this glycine betaine component, you know, the um, small molecule really exists in human, animal kingdom, fish, and plants. So for example, if you look at the desert plains, why the desert plain can survive so nicely, you know, under the uh, strong sunshine, dry condition, because the desert plain has a high concentration of glycine betaine to holding the water. So we're using the same principle uh, to put in uh, this, into a hydrogel or, or medical device, you know, the uh, uh, into a polymer and put it on a medical device surface. So, and then the medical device surface will be uh, coated by a layers of uh, strongly bounded water. So the same principle as the uh, desert plane, you know, hydration uh, principle, but the, uh, you know, in a polymer way. And after many years, then the uh, recently, uh, we discovered another, uh, you know, Zuita only material like TMAO. And so the glycine B10 and TMAO has been, uh, known to uh, use as the uh, protein stabilizer because they use a protein stabilizer that's why you can expect you know they are very good the uh, hydrations and really they are not too many uh, you know the, you know from a polymer synthetic or organic synthetic point of view you can have a plus and minus and then try to uh, combine them but the uh, in the nature you know really uh, there are few you know molecular they are you know available for a synthetic purpose so therefore we also going for the uh, mixed charge approach meaning a uh, plus and minus don't have to be uh, coming out from uh, the same uh, side chain it could be coming from different chains so in the material science people may call this as uh, amphalites and even more recently we you know starting a new material it's a uh, it's so the sweet only material it's kind of inner but now this material not only inner, but also it has a built-in function, like uh, you know immunosuppressive uh, function, and so now the material is kind of uh, our research has been moving from uh, inner material into a more functional material. So you know just one uh, sentence to summarize why does zoetan only work so well is because of the uh, super hydrophilic zoetan only material. So once you put on medical device surface, it's really you cover layers of water. And this water, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, when you're doing implant, they are invisible to the body because the, you know, the body don't generate any uh, immune response to the water. So that's, that's the mechanism to keep it uh, biocompatible. So water is the key. Okay, so right now, you know, over the last one years, I, uh, you know, after I moved to Cornell, so my research have been uh, moving into the new direction. So as I mentioned, you know, we're still working on sweet honey polymer or uh, peptide. But instead of the uh, inner material, now we are working uh, more into the uh, immunosuppressive material or the discovery of the uh, new uh, adjuvant to uh, promoting uh, the vaccines and also uh, try to, uh, you know, developing the uh, material to uh, targeting the cell and also uh, organ. And, you know, this one has been uh, has a four application. One application into a hydrogel like the uh, stem cell and also the uh, stem cell from the core blood. And also we're working a lot with people from our medical school, you know, in the uh, IPSC and also uh, organoid uh, area. And then the second area is in uh, nanomedicine. So developing uh, LOMP, reformulating the uh, LOMP for the uh, uh, mRNA delivery or exosome or the AAV and also uh, conjugate. 
and you know compare with other people you know we we'll try to push in for the uh, low immunogenicity and also targeting and then we also collaborating with people from medical school working on cancer vaccine and also uh, immunotherapy and the other area is application is surface like coding you know working on the artificial non dialysis membrane and new non chips and then finally uh, marine coping that's the area we end up working on uh, you know for 20 years so finally uh, our uh, the uh, material coating finally will be uh, translated to uh, navy and will be on the navy ship uh, very soon on our marina uh, fouling coating but for today's talk uh, you know i will focusing only on the uh, hydrogel okay so for the hydrogel i try to be uh, you know in the next few minutes to address the uh, three major issue so number one is that the uh, for the hydrogel how do you keep those that uh, cell happy when they are inside the hydrogel so for example, if you have a cancer cell or whatever, you know, then it doesn't matter. But when you go in up to the, uh, the stem cell with the uh, core blood, those are, you know, it's not, doesn't matter, it's less sensitive. But when you go in for the uh, stem cell for the core blood, it's very sensitive. As soon as they're touching anything, they will differentiate. So how do you developing a uh, differentiation free the uh, cell expansion? And then the second one is the implant. So once you are implanting, uh, you know, material, uh, you know, sub-Q implantation, the capsule always form. Uh, within uh, one month. So how do you are uh, breaking those limit? And then finally, as I just mentioned, you know, the, um, you know, ultra low founding and also, uh, you know, elastomer, you know, mechanical property, these two don't come together. So you have to compromise one versus another and how do we achieve no com compromise? So those are the three uh, topic I want to talk today. Okay, so first we would like to talk about the, uh, you know, the uh, stem cell expansion without differentiation. And so this problem are really uh, coming out from the, uh, you know, my, you know, when I was in Seattle, I have a collaborator, uh, you know, clinical direct, uh, clinical uh, collaborator in Fred Hodge Cancer Research Center. So they have been using the, uh, you know, the stem cell from the core blood to treating a leukemia rather than using a bone marrow matching because this is uh, much easier for, um, you know, for matching our purpose. And the only problem is that the, uh, usually we don't get enough the uh, stem cell from the core blood and we need to, uh, you know, in ex vivo uh, expansion. And immediately, as I say, you know, once this stem cell touching the surface, they'll go crazy, immediately you differentiate. And so we are developing the, uh, you know, the uh, click chemistry. And so this all is with ionic star polymer. And also this is with ionic uh, peptide with the uh, degradable uh, linker. And so when you have like star polymer with cross linker, with mixed with uh, stem cell together, and that's what we are using to uh, expanding uh, the stem cell. So let's look at the uh, how well the uh, our system works. So this is the uh, the biomarker of the uh, stem cell versus the how many days for our uh, culture work. And this is a 3D. This is our sweet ionic 3D uh, hydrogel. So you can see that the uh, you know this is the process we uh, expansion when occurring in within a 14 days. And you see the our sweet ionic hydrogel can keep the uh, the phenotype uh, you know within the 14 days. But if you look at the polyethylene glycol, that's the uh, blue curve right here. And then you look at the uh, another uh, DX, DXI technology, my collaborator uh, you know, has been used for patient for last 10, 20, 12, 12 years. And so the, uh, you know, that same thing, it's just going down, tight down for day one. And the other two, uh, you know, the uh, famous uh, approach from uh, one from Toronto, another one from a script. And the, uh, so those that uh, we try to mimic these two technology also from day one, it's it just going down, you know, in terms of activity. So only in the 3Ds with only hydrogel can keep it for the, uh, you know, pretty, uh, the, uh, the stem cell for, uh, you know, 14 days without differentiation, why expansion occur. And then we were wondering, uh, is this 14 day, that's it. So we try one more time from 14 day to 24 days. And you can see this is a fresh sample and this is the expansion after 24 days. You know, it looks very similar. And this is our collaborative technology I use for a patient. So, and, okay. And then the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, also we are, we want to testing how efficient, how good is this? And without going into the detail. So usually the uh, engraftment for the mice usually will take like, uh, you know, like 24 to uh, 30 weeks and we didn't need to do it uh, twice. So almost like one year uh, experiment. And so just give you the, uh, the short one is that, you know, with the sweet ionic hydrogel, if we're using uh, 30 stem cell to start with, and the, uh, with the fresh cell, you need to use 3000 to do the same job because after expansion, we can get much more. So roughly uh, speaking, you know, the, uh, we are, 
you know, around the, uh, you know, 73 times the, uh, you know, the uh, more efficient. So if you have a, a few stem cell you expand, then they can do the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, 73, uh, you know, more efficient than the, uh, the other one. Uh, and of course we check to make sure, you know, after uh, uh, two uh, expansion, uh, no, to the uh, engraftment after one year, they're still as good as before. Okay, so mechanism. So when we submitting a paper, you know, the people always ask us, you know, why this hydrogel works so well. And so the, uh, you know, at the beginning, we uh, figure out a, a mechanism like RS, this is a reactive oxygen. So, you know, interesting to see the, uh, you know, reactive oxygen inside the hydrogel, the, um, the, the, uh, you know, the uh, are very low, but the uh, if you under control or our collaborators hydrogen, you know, RS is like, uh, very high, right? And then the uh, reviewer further asking uh, what happened, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, why RS is low. And actually they're pushing us to do one experiment, which is that uh, end up with uh, something uh, very interesting. So what we find out is that the, uh, you know, once you put a stem cell inside our hydrogen, actually the metabolic, it's even lower than in the fresh state. So meaning uh, even if you put a stem cell inside our hydrogel and the, uh, even though we're operating at noon temperature like 20 degree, but you know, it might be, uh, looks like minus 20, you know, low temperature. So it's amazingly, it's even lower than the uh, noon temperature. So some, and you know, of course, this is just the beginning. We'll try to study more mechanism. And one of the mechanism is try to look at how the pore size, everything effect. So this morning, uh, Dave, you know, the uh, point out, you know, the, um, you know, the hydrogen, you know, his hydrogen can control the pore side. That's amazing. You know, I didn't think about that way. So that's another, uh, you know, good system to look at the, uh, when you can control the pore size and what happened. I think that pore size will be another, uh, you know, factor uh, to look at because the diffusion, the ROS, you know, diffusion in and out, you know, all the nutrient in and out, you know, that could be uh, relevant. But that's where we are right now. The paper published in uh, Nature Medicine uh, two years ago. Okay. And then the, uh, we went uh, further, you know, the, uh, you know, it's interesting to know that the uh, the Zuita only hydrogen also has uh, some amazing uh, property. Uh, it's like cell heating, truly cell heating. So I still remember one time when student uh, walk into my office, I uh, bring a uh, four piece of uh, hydrogen. So I asked the student, say, what happened? So the student just putting uh, you know four hydrogen together, and now you can start to stretch and uh, bending. I was amazed. I was asking like, you know, what happened? So anyway, so we done a more study, and then finally we find out is that the, uh, you know, because of the iron, you know, it, it doesn't go through the uh, surface, uh, you know, the uh, reconstruction. So therefore, we can really, uh, you know, even you uh, after you forming uh, this material, if you cut them into uh, pieces, waiting for two weeks, they still can uh, connect together. And so in this paper, we also, uh, you know, putting a different cell type on a different hydrogen, and then they can grow and they can grow into each other. So we are hoping to group soft tissue, hard tissue, you know, together. So I think the key point with this one is that, you know, a lot of people doing cell heating uh, hydrogen. So you had to put a clay, you had to shining a UV, you know, that's not biocompatible. So in this case, not only material is biocompatible, but also the price is biocompatible. But certainly we are not just doing this for fun, but the, uh, I think use this principle. We come up with the, uh, some, you know, way to making a simple uh, hydrogen. Okay, that's the, uh, because remember, you know, the way how we are doing this is that we're doing a clear chemistry, star polymer, doing this, making hydrogen is complicated. So with this uh, cell heating uh, mechanism, we were able to making a very simple uh, injectable hydrogen. So basically we got this with only hydrogen and then you have the uh, processor. So this is exactly the same uh, at home, you make a spaghetti, same same one, processor. And then you make into, uh, you know, microgel and then you could, uh, you know, lyophilize into powder and uh, you can sterilize. And then you could, uh, you know, you know, with this uh, powder, you know, you can put a little bit into your protein or cell solution for encapsulation. And results showing that the, uh, for example, here, just one quick result showing, you know, with the uh, hydrogel, if you are uh, inject, you know, through the needle and with just using a buffer, you know, a half cell die, but if you just put a little bit powder into the uh, needle and uh, when after injection, you can see that the, uh, you know, the uh, cell as good as before. So any you know, tiny bit of hydrogel make a difference. But anyway, so if you using the uh, other type of the hydrogel, you know, the, uh, then they probably are not enough mechanical property. So the cell uh, adhesion property really giving a cohesive 
you know, energy of this hydrogel. So you can uh, adjusting a uh, mechanical property. So this is kind of an engineering way to uh, realizing uh, something simple. Now you can use this for a uh, culture or stem cell. Okay, so the next one I'm going to talk about is the uh, capsule free uh, implants. So as you know, the, uh, you know, just now I just show you uh, the, the stem cell are very happy inside the cell, but now we need to look at the uh, what happened outside, you know, because uh, once implant the outside capsule formation is a big issue. So the, uh, you know, in terms of application, we hoping, uh, you know, for all the medical device and also for sale in capillation material. So capsule is a big problem. And the challenging is that the, uh, you know, people already try uh, many, many material and no matter is ceramic or it's a metal or it's a polymer or, you know, so hard, you know, the, uh, all this material really, uh, you know, we're forming a capsule uh, within uh, one month. So unless you play some trick like using the uh, porous material or, uh, you know, other, you know, or, or put an immunosuppressive the uh, agent on the material, you know, the otherwise the material, you know, capsule will form. And, you know, in 2013, we published a paper in our nature biotechnology and this paper for the first time we show, we're able to extend, you know, for one month uh, limit to uh, three months. So here is the HEMA. So when you are implanting the HEMA, this is the tissue. Did you see there's a uh, thin, thin uh, capsule right here? You know, this is the collagen density at the interface. And then if you plant this with the only material, basically it just, you, you, you're planting a water at the interface. That's why the capsule don't form. And this result looks so simple, but it really take us probably like eight years or so, you know, the, uh, to achieve this goal because we have to optimize our hydrogen until we are able to achieve truly, you know, because a lot of time people thinking about say, oh, hydrogen is low folding, but it's not the case. When we, you know, the, uh, you know, the, uh, when we start this project, and uh, we use hydrogel, even Zwita hydrogel still doesn't work. So we had to push, push to the limit so that when it's extremely uh, hydrophilic and then it works, okay? So it took like eight years in order to achieve this. So 2013 and the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, when 2016 actually, when the, uh, the Nature of Biotech uh, reporter was, uh, you know, the uh, pick our project is one of the A major hit. So she asked me, said the, uh, what are you doing, you know, with this hydrogen? I say, ah, you know, we still are uh, trying to look pushing for two limit. One limit is like, you know, three months, still not long enough. Can we do one year? And then another, uh, you know, the uh, limit is like, can we make a very strong mechanical property? And so, you know, the uh, 2021, you know, actually just a few months ago, finally, we were able to uh, further, my, further, further uh, you know, optimize our, you know, the uh, study, our hydrogen. So we are able to, uh, you know, achieve, uh, the uh, one year uh, implant without any uh, uh, capsule formation. So for example, material you implant and after one year, you took it out, it's as good as before. And uh, really not, but for the HEMA, you know, after two months or so, you probably will be hard to uh, pull it out. You have to use scissors to cut them. But we also uh, make this into a uh, different holes. We're making a whole shape and everything looks great. You know, they will be, uh, you know, really just as good as before. So one year, you know, so I think principles also are easy to understand. You are just kind of implanting uh, water. Okay, so my time is almost up. So the, uh, you know, finally, I would like to talk about the, uh, how do we deal with the uh, ultra low folding versus the elastomer? Okay, so, you know, the, uh, you know, for example, for the, uh, if you have a medical device with strong mechanical property, and then you, uh, you know, medical device of the cold surface, of course, there's no non-folding property. So usually what you do to put a non-folding material on medical device through the coating. But as you know, the coating of detachment is a big issue. You know, so therefore, can we do a coating free non-folding polymer elastomer? So 2017, we published a paper, we show, we have a design. For example, for traditionals with ionic polymer. And uh, so it's a uh, carboxy group with quantum amine but we need to design this polymer to hiding the charge. So we make it into a COOR ester into a hiding negative charge. We also make this into a tertiary amine to a hiding and a positive charge. So now this is neutral. We can make a piece of material like this guy is very, very strong, but we only hydrolyze the outermost layer. When this R group hydrolyzed, then protonation, deprotonation occur. So, Inside still this material, outside is hydrophilic. So now we achieve coating free uh, non folding uh, polymer elastomer. And so, if you, you know, because of time, I probably not going into the detail. So, if you look at Zuita hydrogel, very non folding uh, with the bacteria, but mechanical properties are very weak. 
So if you look at the uh, elastomer before hydrolysis, the middle one, you know, non fouling property is very bad, mechanical property is very good. Okay. But now, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, uh, our final outcome, the, the last one, these guys. Okay. So finally, you will see the non fouling is very good and mechanical properties are very good. Okay. So, you know, by 2017, we think this trick, we play this trick, we think this is properties ultimate. It's uh, the best that we can do. And then the last three years, uh, we find something even beyond our exploitation, you know, exploitation. So these paper are published, they are, you know, 2021, the, uh, just a, a few months ago. So we were able to, uh, you know, producing our Zuita on the elastomer. Uh, through, this is my last slide. So again, as I just mentioned before, you know, non-fouling and also mechanical property, these two don't come together. Actually, they go opposite, right? And so usually people doing copolymer had to compromise both property or people might doing composite material. So for biomaterial application, if you ate a lot of clay into your material into composite, then you know, toxicity can be an issue. But now, you know, our trick is that the, uh, we're using the, uh, you know, 3% of uh, carboxybutane, you know, to sweating the hydrogel. And then we are using sulfabutane as the major one to locking because carboxybutane and sulfabutane molecular mechanism is totally different. I can tell you more into this. But through uh, this formulation, we're able to make a very strong uh, hydrogel. And so you can uh, tie the knots, you know, very strong. So I think the unique of this, you know, for the, uh, the, the, the reason this work is very unique is because the, uh, you know, carboxybutane, sulfabutane, both of them are extremely soft. But now you can them in together, it's suddenly going up uh, mechanical property. This is not simply a double network uh, story. Okay. so. Now come to my conclusion. So over my last 20 years, the uh, you know, research, I only not end up with one word, you know, conclusion is hydration. So why does Zuita only material work so well is because it's invisible to the body, okay? So that's why tissue and biocompatibility are very good. And why the PEG, you know, sometimes has a problem is because the, our body system see hydrophobic. So right now at the Cornell, you know, when I'm talking about Zuita only 2.2, you know, really we are go beyond hydration. So for fundamental, we are integrating our immunology into biomaterial rather than just tell people with hydration, but we are hoping to do us, you know, go deeper and application, you know, translate biomaterial into a clinic. So we also working with dairy group to see whether this material could be used for the bio ink. And then this is the acknowledgement and disclosure. So have a three stop company working on different things. And then finally, dairy mentioned, you know, we have a Zoita only conference. Last conference supposed to be in Boston last year, but now we'll be uh, changing to uh, next year. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shayi, that was great. Um, we do have some time for a couple questions, I think, before we break. Um, yeah, Bing Ling. Hey, sorry. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So you mentioned the um, the cells have have low metabolic activity inside the gel. Uh, is that because? Oh, maybe what's the reason? <laughs> oh, know okay. You know, I think if I tell you the story, you know, we submit a paper to uh, Nature at the beginning, and then it would take us one year review all amazing and ask us to say what's the mechanism. We find RS, and then. You know, the review asking why, then we find out low metabolic, you know, one and a half years, and then two and, you know, the, uh, and then later they asking why we give up, <laughs> you know, so we are paper finally published in the nature of medicine. We have no idea why. So that's why right now we are team, I'm, right now we are teaming up with the uh, people in our immunology. So hopefully, yeah, uh, we could uh, looking at the more biological uh, mechanism and try to understand why. So this is really uh, interesting to see. You know, I think it's interesting. You know, I also surprised to see the uh, the cell inside the hydrogel, the metabolic is even lower than in the water. Yeah, so those are something, you know, puzzle me, but that will be the uh, future uh, study. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll ask a quick question. So shall you, the, the I'm always amazed at the, self-healing uh, material component of this. And, and um, I was gonna ask you in the, in the context of, of the presentation that Dave made, what are your thoughts about using that approach for an adhesive, right? If you can engineer these materials to, to heal to each other, can you uh, engineer them specifically to heal to tissues effectively? 
you know, I think that definitely is a, uh, you know, the, I think Dave's uh, work is amazing. You know, the, uh, I think they want, uh, you know, we can adhesive for a long time. So actually we have been uh, working on uh, this adhesive a little bit, but not in the contents of uh, tissue, but content of marine coating. So yes. we were able to coating as with our only coating on the ship surface and you use a knife to cut them and they will heal immediately. But later, since we don't have a real, the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the real application in mind. So that, that's why we didn't uh, push forward. But I think they, uh, you know, that sale heating and the, uh, you know, use that tissue in that direction. I think is really something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm trying to check the chat. I don't see anything in chat. Any other, any other questions for Xiaoyu before we, before we break for lunch? So I, I had one uh, more question. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if, uh, because you were saying that, uh, Hydro when we consider a, a material that's hydrophilic and hydrophobic, these to get the stiffness, the, the mechanical properties and biofouling properties there, they kind of oppose each other. Do, do you ever consider composites of uh, with sweeter ionic uh, with a sweeter ionic matrix? Yes. And is there any work in that direction? Yes, I think the uh, you know that that's what I, one one thing I mentioned is that yeah uh, because hydrophilic hydrophobic you know they compromise you know together right and so that's why I think yes you're right also I mentioned the composite is one of the ideal but the reason we didn't go that way is the uh, you know once you go comp composite and then you're doing implants for example like using clay or whatever particularly you know small amount is okay but when you go a uh, large amount I just worry about whether leaching you know all this occur but certainly. You know, all those are, uh, you know, if we're adding a clay and too much and then diffuse, you know, it will diffuse out. But otherwise, I think that's another idea. Yes, to uh, using composite to, uh, but so far, idea we are using right now, you know, the uh, first idea is to separate hydrophobic, hydrophilic, separate them. And then the second idea is something I, we even haven't figured out right now why. Because when you're doing, you know, when our undergraduate student doing research, so they found sulfur betaine and copper betaine, both of them just like two are tofu, so soft. But as soon as they emerge, then it becoming a very strong uh, material. So it's so amazing. So we still try to understand why. So most of the time for people doing double network, the idea is that one soft, one hard, right? A composite idea. When you get together, your works, right? But in our case, the other new paper we found, both material are very soft. They can't take advantage of each other. So, you know, the, uh, you know, two are very, very soft, but when you kind of 3% in a different order, put it together, then it's suddenly mechanical probably shooting up as good as the uh, previous trick we played. And we still need to understand why. Yeah, I will probably follow up with an email. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is great. Uh, this is great. So um, it's been a great morning. Um, I'm sure everyone is ready for, for a lunch break. We are pretty much on time. Uh, so uh, let's break for lunch and we'll reconvene at, I believe, 